um, I will talk today about another research direction in my lab that's uh, sort of a clinical, so you'll have to, to, uh, to change your thinking into analyzing of thinking about data that predict risk of development of complications in diabetes. And that research stems from uh, uh, our long-time interest um, in uh, the fact that when we were looking for advanced glycation end products, we knew one thing that co uh, co uh, collagen from di diabetic patients is much less soluble than uh, com uh, by comparison by from other individuals. It's it's. Uh, less digestible, it's more insoluble, also it's more fluorescent. This was the only marker we had at the time to look into advanced glycation, which led in fact to this study in which when we measured uh, fluorescence linked to collagen in uh, skins from uh, patients with various degrees of complications, the more fluorescence they had, the more severe was the retinopathy, the nephropathy, the arterial stiffness, the joint stiffness, and that led together with the discovery of early advanced glycation end products, carboxymethylysine and pentosidine, that led us to collaborate with the uh, Diabetes Complication Trials Group, which was a 10-year intervention trial started in 83 to 93, in which we did an ancillary study taking two skin biopsies at the end of this period uh, to ask the question, does tight control of diabetes lower these products and these advanced glycation products in skin, and does it also, is it associated with complications and so forth? The reason why at the time we took two skin biopsies, it was the early days of uh, the chemistry of uh, advanced glycation end products, and we thought that the, this chemistry would evolve and that new products would be available later on. And in fact, so we took two biopsies there, and the patients were then followed, the entire ED cohort, these 1,440 patients, were then followed till today. Okay, and this study is still uh, going on as a follow-up study without any intervention. So well, at the time we had 216 patients, we took biopsies on these. Uh, there were 122 in intensive and 94 in uh, conventional glycemic control. And then the, the parameters that were evaluated, and I won't go into detail in order to save time, was retinopathy, nephropathy, and confirmed clinical neuropathy. So the products we measured, there were six collagen markers in this first biopsy. There was simply fructose lysine. This is just glucose sticking onto collagen, the same thing as you have in a hemoglobin A1C. There's a fluorescence, pentosidine, CML, and then the soluble uh, acid and insoluble collagen. These are parameters of cross-linking. So the data we got at the time was when we looked at the, the evolution of retinopathy in EDIC, we found that glycation, meaning fructose lysine or furosine, and carboxymethylysine levels in skin collagen predict the risk of future 10-year progression of diabetic retinopathy and nephropathy in the DCCT slash EDIC trial, okay? This was a, a study in collaboration with the DCCT group and my uh, longtime uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Saul Genuth, who was uh, involved in the study. So, since then, so in a nutshell, this chemistry of glycation starts with what I call stresses, the most important one being glucose. It makes your, your amadori product, this fructose lysine. Uh, and then they, you have degradation either to pentosidine and CML, but the new products that have been since discovered, which we are, have assayed in, in the common studies, number one, your glucose goes via glycolysis to methylglyoxal, make the hy methylglyoxal hydrometazolone, and another compound called CEL, carboxyethylysine, looks like CML, but it's a CEL. Okay. So the other thing is that uh, everything below this axis is oxidation, okay? All these are oxidation products, and one of the intermediate that is shared with lipid peroxidation or inflammation is its glyoxal that can make 
not only in part CML, but this glyoxal hydrometers alone. So the new products we are going to measure are all those blue uh, marked products. These we already knew, they were predictive of re uh, risk of retinopathy. So just to show you that uh, uh, in old skin, 80 year old skin, when you look at all the AGs you can measure, glucosapine, this glucose derived molecule is a single major advanced glycation end product, and together with fructose lysine, they're the single major most important modifications. When you have diabetes levels go two to three a fold up for most of the products. Now, the first question we ask, does this, do these reflect past glycemia? Since we took the, the, the biopsies at the end of the DCCT, we asked, do they reflect past glycemia? So you see, uh, there was a relationship with screening A1C for, for example, say, let's start with uh, fructose lysine. It was uh, associated with screening A1C, but the longer the duration of mean glycemia, the A1C nears to biopsy, the A1C over the past year, or the, the biopsy, the, these, P, these, these uh, P values increased. What's interesting here for the fructose lysine, the, P, the, the, Kaiser, the R square value decreased, while the one for the glucosapine stopped, uh, kept increasing. We think the value would be higher, this was obtained by enzymatic digestion and then LCMS mass spectrometry, but we don't recover all of it because it's enzymatically digested. But you see that the only two that panned out of the two new markers are, are fructose lysine, which is the same as furosine, and glucosapine, while CEL, the, the hydroimidazolone, were not predictor of past, were not measures of cumulative past glycemia. However, when you look at which ones correlate best with the other advanced glycation end products, and you find that glucosapine is strongly correlated with age, strongly correlated with diabetes duration, while, while the fructose lysine were not, uh, and then they're also strongly correlated with the methylglyoxal levels, hydroimidazolone. Uh, alone. And you will see this is important because uh, both neuropathy and retinopathy are thought to be related to hydroimidazolone. alone. So let's look at the number of events at baseline of, of this 16 year long period. For retinopathy, 60, the 91 of the 213 patients that were in, uh, uh, followed uh, in EDIC, 91 s developed retinopathy. 50 out of, of, uh, uh, of uh, 295, 195 developed nephropathy, and neuropathy, 74 out of um, 165 uh, developed uh, neuropathy. When uh, at baseline, there was no difference between the patient groups with or without subsequent retinopathy, nephropathy, or neuropathy for age, gender, diabetes duration, the treatment group they were, mean blood pressure, hypertension, triglycerides, and so forth. Mean A1C, however, was higher in all those who developed an event, meaning they developed nephropathy, blah, 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 or neuropathy, even patients also were slightly older and had slightly higher LDL cholesterol. But otherwise, there was no clinical difference between most of the patients. So the questions we now asked, which set of advanced glycation and product data best predict, predicts progression of complication? The second question, is the predictive effect of AGEs weakened by adjustment for A1C? And the reason is, if you adjust for A1C and all the effect, the association falls apart, then it means the single major effect is due to glycemia and not to the products that stick uh, on collagen in the skin, meaning in the tissue. And the third one, vice versa, does adjustment for AGEs weaken the ability of mean glycemia to predict progression? So let's look first at nephropathy, then neuropathy, and then retinopathy. So the combined set of 10 AGEs predicts nephropathy progression, but the effect is abolished by adjusting for mean DCCT and 
EDIC A1C. So this is shown here. The original set was hi fairly highly correlated with uh, nephropathy progression, but when you adjusted that value, um, that value then fell apart from 0.002 to 0.34. Uh, we remain here a little bit significant. But when we had the combined set of 10 AGEs, you see that p-value was more significant. So meaning ad adding additional AGEs to the original six gave us better predictive uh, uh, value for the long-term prediction. When we singled out and asked the question, which ones are the, s the, the two AGEs that most uh, reliably predict nephropathy, the furosine, glycated lysine, and glucosapine were strong predictors. But when we did also backward elimination reaction, the single one predictor for nephropathy was furosine. You see this is pretty strong, 0.001 um, uh, p-value. When you adjust it for DCCT and mean A1C, glycemia, it's, the association remained f a strong, even if we adjusted to, for all the what we call significant factors, mean glycemia, age, LDL, retinopathy, log albumin excretion rate, and so forth. So what this means, that if you today measure in a diabetic the levels of furosine in skin, that this remains a strong predictor of, ret of nephropathy progression in spite of all subsequent or previous adjustment that you can make. So it's a better predictor than mean glycemia. And when you look at neuropathy, pro uh, uh, it's very much the same. Neuropathy, the whole set, predicts even better, uh, at least as good, if not better, the risk of progression of neuropathy than the original set. And what emerged of both furosine and the methyl hydroxyl hydroimidazolone, meaning that this methyl modification may be very important for the progression of, neuropath of a neuropathy. And in fact, even when we adjusted for all the significant factors, it remained positive, except for the furosine. So the, methyl the methylglaxal hydrometazolone is a better predictor of progression of neuropathy than the furosine. Now retinopathy, so let's look first at all individual factors. This is a, a, a vision research thing. So we, I put all the factors that came up by uh, univariate analysis. So you see all of them, except for CL and glyoxylhydrometazolone, are basically predictors of the 16-year risk of progression of retinopathy. A pretty strong is furosine, CML, we already published that before. But new is the fact that the glucose crosslink, glucosapine, is an extremely strong predictor, and methylglaxal is also. So now the statistician did backward elimination and asked, uh, I can skip this data, it's the same as we've seen before. If you adjust, the, if you add more, it's even more uh, uh, significant than the previous set. Now if you, uh, what came out from backward elimination uh, 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 statistics was the fact that furosine and glucosapine, now that's funny, the two forms of glucose that stick onto the tissue, furosine and glucosapine, are the single strongest predictor of the risk, of the 16 year risk of having a progression of retinopathy. And you see when you adjusted the furosine, that p-value dropped a uh, hundredfold, while the glucosapine dropped only from less than 001 to 0007. So glucosapine, when you adjust for all significant risk factors that are by themselves predictor of the development risk of retinopathy, still stays, remains a positive predictor of evolution of retinopathy. So finally and importantly, when you do the reverse analysis, you take the hemoglobin A1C during the DCCT and you adjust for the AGEs, 
this association, the ability of the DCCT-A1C to predict the 16-year risk is abolished by adjustment of the skin products. So this means the ability of the DCCT-A1C to predict the risk of retinopathy is not mediated by the AGEs. The AGEs are an independent risk factor for the progression of diabetic retinopathy. So two slides more. So overall summary, skin collagen, furosine, fructose lysine, and glucosapine are strong, very long-term predictors of diabetic retinopathy and other microvascular complications in spite of adjustment for past and future glycemia and all other risk factors. Two, glucosapine is a strong predictor of retinopathy, stronger predictor than furosine, and remains so after all adjustments. Third, methylglaxal is a strong predictor of neuropathy, is as strong a predictor of neuropathy as furosine, and remains so after all adjustments. And DCCT-A1C predicts pro progression of all complications, but becomes non-significant after adjustment of skin AGs. So you're basically left with the fact that glycated lysine, glucosapine, and methylglaxal, imidazolam, are the single most important predictors that we would have to measure in skin of a diabetic in order to have uh, a clue for the uh, prediction risk of complication evolution. So the conclusions and speculations, fructose lysine and glucosapine are expected to be co-mediators, meaning participating in the process of diabetic retinopathy, for example, by damage to the extracellular matrix and impaired cell attachment to the AG-rich matrix. There's been data from um, Alan State and so forth with the glycated matrix, and he finds that the, the glycated matrix is not a good adhesion substrates for uh, retinal progenitor uh, stem cells to attach and repair the damage. So the data also supports a previous, previously proposed role of methylglaxal in neuropathy and endothelial cell dysfunction. Thank you.